Hello, I'm Maddie Harlan from Permaculture Magazine and today Tim and I are at Ragman's Lane Farm in Gloucestershire which is a 60 acre permaculture farm and we're here to discover the range of enterprises happening on the land here, how it's organised and to interview Matt Dunwell who's been running the place for the last 30 years. The way that Ragman's works is that there's a very transparent ownership structure. Uh, I have a farm manager. We have um, contracts with the people that rent the land office, and it's very transparent. And people know where they are with that, and it seems to work over a long period of time. It's not very creative in terms of land ownership, but it, that's that's what we do at Ragman's. And so, so it's enabled us to use Ragman's as a sort of a platform for other people to come in and use the land, which is where we've ended up now. So the, the farm actually runs about a, a, a quarter to a third of the land. We have our own organic apples and our own orchards and we make our own apple juice. But um, for instance, behind me here there's Craig and Becky who've got two acres of organic um, uh, vegetables. That's their own business and they rent the land office and we have a, a really nice constructive relationship. Um, Steve Pickup has his Willow Bank here um, and then up until about a month ago we had a couple of local guys who were keeping um, their sheep on the broad scale grassland farm and there are various other people that plug into the farm at various different times of the year and what we've tried to do is create a platform where people can get access to land um, and, and try and run their own business um, as much as they can. That's and really, when you look at what you can do on an allotment size scale, the thing that having 60 acres enables you to do is you, you can scale up and share machinery. So that's a really important thing for, for sort of permaculture thinking. Um, and the other thing that, that the potential to do this, although it's really hard to actually execute this, is that when you fit together different enterprises on a farm like this, you can start weaving in the outputs of one enterprise being the inputs of another enterprise. And we've had examples of that. Um, and, and I think that that's one of the key skills that we've got to relearn as permaculture farmers and communities. Um, so what could you do on this? Well, over the years, over the last 30 years, we've had uh, uh, meat boxes with pork, lamb, chicken, egg going into Bristol. We've shared that delivery with the Mandy who was running the, the veggie boxes. Um, um, and we've, we've also then developed a whole shiitake mushroom enterprise. I think we were one of the first people to do that. And at one stage we were making really good money off that um, until everybody else started doing it as well. Um, so, and, and that was a, a exciting thing for me because when we first looked at the farm I was brought out to the middle of this 10 acre grassland field by the uh, agricultural valuation agent and he said you can you can run an enterprise from this 60 acres that will support half a salary um, because you can only get so many cattle on this land and I was really interested in the woodland and there's a little green green uh, trackway that runs through the farm uh, and I was thinking there's something that we can do with this space that's really interesting, that's like a niche space. And in fact, 10 years later, that's where we were growing our mushroom logs because it's, it's uh, dark, it's damp, uh, there's low wind speed. It was absolutely perfect for that. And we grew about 20,000 pounds worth of mushroom logs a year up this little trackway. Um, and it's just a really good example of how when you start looking at the, your niche habitats, in an area like this uh, and thinking out the box, there are loads of um, enterprises that you can stack into a system that are complementary. Um, 
Uh, another organisation that uses the farm as a bit of a platform is Bees for Development, who are um, the champions of natural beekeeping. And it's a real um, badge of honour to have their teaching hives here at Ragnall's. So they teach probably, I think, three or four courses a year in natural beekeeping um, based here. And they have five or six hives um, down at the bottom of the farm, which, which help uh, pollinate our orchards, which is very nice. So uh, bees and honey is another thing that we've stacked in here. And I say we've stacked in here, like, I think that we, I haven't designed bees into this system. What I've done is, is try to open up a platform and then I find if you do that, people find their way in. Uh, um, and, and we've had various people coming and going here. We've had the food hub um, using us as a drop-off point. Um, so there's a lot of social interaction on the farm. And the other thing, of course, that we do is we teach here. And we've been teaching since that fateful course that Bill uh, ran in 91. Um, and now I think now we're up to about 15 to 20 residential courses a year. Um, those are the ones that run. Um, uh, and it's a combination of land-based courses. So I teach permaculture here with Carrie, um, and uh, rather Carrie teaches permaculture with me, I'm the assistant. Um, and we have other various visiting luminaries. So we have Hyra Restrepo coming through from Colombia teaching about biofertilizer. Darren Doherty is going to come and do a course uh, in a month's time. And those are sort of real land-based courses. Then we do um, some energy stuff, some sh shamanistic stuff, some ecstatic dance, yoga. So there's a, a quite a big mix of different energies that come through the site. But for me, one of the things that keeps Ragman's as a, uh, an evolving beastie is the the gift of people coming through the place and kicking the tires and they're sort of going uh, well quite often they're saying what a great place lovely place well done which is all very nice um, quite often they're saying why don't you do this why don't you do that and I really welcome that energy because it's what keeps us on our metal um, and, and I think a lot of the positive developments that we've put in place over the last 15 years are as a result of people suggesting A, B or C that we do. There's a concept that I have in my mind of dormant permaculture where um, you, you can take a 60 acre site and, and somebody has to have an overview of that site and say these are where our wild energies are coming from, this is our nutrient flows, this is where the wind is coming from, uh, if we want wind shelter we need to put in big scale structure. Uh, if we want to catch water, that's got to precede almost any other design criteria that we have on the farm. And then people who want to come in and use the farm as a platform f sit, fit around that major design decision process, which has evolved over the first sort of 10 years of us being here, I think. And and I would say a lot of those... So, so I... I put in the possibility of the farm coming off the main water mains, for instance. Um, I, I put in that system and then it's all piped in across the whole farm. Now, we actually still have water mains supplying the farm, but the possibility of coming off the water mains is there because I've put that in. Um, and similarly to the, the pond here, um, we could be using this far, far more than we are, but because of the the policy environment that we're in today, which is cheap fossil fuels, expensive labour, we're in a really difficult policy environment. We're, we're without leadership in terms of how to take society into a more environmentally conscious uh, uh, place. And so what you can do with an area like this is put in place permaculture, broad scale design principles, and they sit there in the landscape dormant until you need to use them. And I think that that's partly what we've been trying to do at Ragland, is put in, so, so we've increased organic matter in the soils, we've increased the, the, the tree coverage on the farm, uh, we've slowed up the, the passage of water through the site, um, we've put in tree crops that are gonna give us perennial cropping, uh, and, we, and also the, 
we've, we've integrated with the local community a lot better than we used to. So all of the social side of that, permaculture interaction, uh, is, is as important as the physical design that you put on place. The dormant permaculture idea for me really helps. Uh, uh, it was a sort of aha moment for me because I, I spent 10 years going like, we've got to feed our pigs out of the pond because you can grow carbohydrates using reed mace. And, and I think there was a moment when I just thought, okay, I don't have to do all this stuff now because it doesn't make sense to, to, the, to ordinary people. Um, but what I want to do is put in place the, the systems that I can activate if I need to. And that helps me to... Um, to have a conversation with mainstream people around the possibilities of what land can do without having to go down the whole uh, uh, living a life of drudgery in the 21st century route. You know, we may have to get there. I'm not saying we, we may have to do all that stuff, but it does seem counterproductive to tr try and get people to go there in today's policy environment. But what we need to do is move the political, the political debate towards supporting this sort of stuff a bit more.